so many conferences, is that there seems to be a title for just about every vertical you could imagine these days. Um, you know, things like a VP of social used to be really unusual, and now, now I, I see that title all the time. Um, VP of mobile, another one. Um, but at, at some point, whether it's the CMO or somebody with a slightly different title, um, you're dealing, you, you're, you need to um, be riding on top of all this, but at the same time, you need to sort of understand it all, which is which is a pretty hard thing to do when some of these channels are so you know complex in and of themselves. So um, so that that's what this next um, channel, this next panel about the re-engineered marketer is really all about. So uh, should they start coming up? Are they ready? Yeah. So come on up, guys. As they do, we're get, should moderator go first. <laughs> so. Um, our moderator um, for this is um, Karen Primo, right there. She's a principal um, in the global media and entertainment practice of Booz and Company, and um, she really kind of has the has the the, the broad overview that uh, is kind of required for this uh, for this kind of, of panel. Um, you know, she's based in New York, and she consults to media companies across the t television, digital, radio, magazine, book, music, and newspaper industries. Just a few. Um, on issues such as growth strategy, sales force effectiveness, digital and social media strategy, capability building, and organizational design. Um, she's also the co-author of um, a recent study that uh, I'd actually like to take a look at myself, called From Campaigns to Capabilities, um, The Impact of Social Media on Marketing and Beyond. And that was a 2011 study that focused on how leading marketers are building social media capabilities into their organization, which virtually all of you are, I think. So with that, um, give our panel um, your attention and uh, take it away. Great. Thanks, Kathy. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here this morning. And we have a great panel of marketers. And our topic of this morning is how brand marketing has evolved and what brand marketers have to do to, to stay on top of that evolution and, and to continue to win. So I think I'll quickly introduce our panel and then have a quick introduction and then we'll jump into our questions. So with us today are John Anton, VP of Marketing for Valspar Paint. I want to get these titles right, so I'm going to use my notes a little bit. Julie Ginches, who's also VP of Marketing for Z Data Zoo. Shane Judd, who's the Director of Digital Marketing for Kitchens and Bath Americas for Kohler. And finally, we have Gary Milner, Global Marketing Director for Digital Marketing for Lenovo. So Kathy started us off this morning with some anecdotes about what digital is doing to people's lifestyle, how it's changing, how people consume media, and how people ultimately consume advertising as well. Um, but I'm a consultant, so I brought some facts about what digital, what's happening in digital and what the outlook is in digital. But I think we'll frame up our discussion a little bit and, and give us a sense of what these guys are up against in terms of the new challenges for brand marketing. So quickly, Forrester just put out, well not just put out, but recently put out its interactive marketing forecast. And they're predicting that by 2016, digital advertising spend will double to more than $77 billion. And that is going to be 26% of the total marketing mix, second only to TV. And in that same year, e-marketers predicting that 75% of all mobile phones in the US will be smartphones. Kagan is anticipating that in 2015, that there'll be 105 million tablets in the US. That's up from 18 million today. And they're also predicting that we'll have 55, rather 59 million DVR households up from 44 million today. And that's taken into account a lot of cord cutting behavior. So also another disruptive trend there. Not only will there be more DVRs, but there will be more people consuming on-demand content, um, even more disruptive for the TV landscape. And finally, I think we've probably all read recent research from Comscore and Facebook suggesting that there is an, an increase in intent to purchase when consumers are exposed to advertising for brands within Facebook. So I think that gives us a hint of the staying power of social media as an advertising platform as we look ahead. So brand marketers are up against a lot. It's a really chaotic landscape. And there's really, can anyone really manage a brand today? That's the question. So with that, I'd like to open it up to our panel. Um, John, I'm going to start with you. You've been in brand marketing for almost 10 years now, today at Valspar and, and formerly with Mars. 
So what new skills and capabilities does a brand marketer need today that they didn't need maybe 10 years ago or in the past? Yeah, um, first of all, thank you for being here. Bob's a tough act to follow, so uh, we'll try and keep this entertaining. Yeah, I didn't realize there was a clock and the bright lights. Yeah, right, the lights. Um, I think, as all of you, I assume, would agree, but I mean, I think marketing at its core still is rooted in ideas, whether those are new product ideas or innovative ways to kind of reach your consumer. So that certainly has not changed, but if I were to summarize, I think the probably two words that best speak to the changes that certainly I've witnessed and most of you in the room have, uh, I would say it's kind of iteration and engagement. And I think iteration uh, for us, I can recall there's a colleague of mine, actually Julie in the room, who worked with me at Mars, and 10 years ago when we were launching campaigns for Pedigree or Whiskas, all of the effort was in advance of the campaign. So if the launch date was April 1st, we worked like crazy from January to April to get the TV done, to get the print done, to figure out what the website was going to look like, to figure out the out of home. And literally on April 1st, we would all high five each other and say, whew, the campaign's out, you know, now let's sit back and wait for the results. And in the packaged goods industry with um, IRI or Nielsen, there's a lag time. So literally, you'd kind of wait around for a month or two to determine was the campaign successful, was it moving the needle in terms of sales. And as you all well know, I mean, that world is gone. I think today it's all about being able to iterate your campaign and make real-time agile adjustments as you go. And uh, Google's classic for that. I mean, I read a story recently. They're, they're iterating the color of the box, the search box, daily in different markets, determining you know, what the impact is. And so we've tried to take a lesson from that and be much more flexible and kind of iterative. And it means that marketing is a continual process instead of kind of point-in-time marketing. And I think the second one, which is obvious, Bob alluded to it, and we've talked about before, but engagement, um, you know, this is cliched, but never before have you been able to kind of talk to consumers directly the way you can now. And I think in, a, in my world of paint, um, most people, though some of you in the room may agree with this, but most people want help with finding the right color. That's kind of the most intimidating aspect of the project, more so than frankly painting your room, which is a lot of labor. But um, we've just recently launched an app, which you can use on an iPhone device or an iPad, where you can actually have a live color consultation with one of our trained color consultants from our office in the comfort of your home. And you can show them with the dual screen FaceTime technology what your room looks like, the aesthetics of your room, your style. You can ask for advice, and our consultants can literally drag and drop color chips that will be superimposed over the wall that you're looking at with your phone. And I think, hopefully, we just launched it, but it's a good example of trying to create engagement real time with consumers and, and frankly, in our business, kind of get involved much earlier in the process. So if we can get our brand involved with these folks when they're thinking about color and during that inspiration period, we've just streamlined the process and, and made it much more sticky so that they then seek out our brand. Because unfortunately today, they seek out the retailer typically first and then the brand second. So I think those two things are, there are many others, but for, for us and, and kind of from my perspective, those are the two most relevant changes that have occurred in the last you know, 10 plus years. Great, thanks. So Julie, you've said that marketing is actually the new R&D. So what did you mean by that? Sure, and, and John touched on it really talking about everything in real time now. Because everything is digital, you have to be able to almost have like an opportunity alerting system so that you know exactly what the consumer's doing at the point they're doing it. Yep. So by the time a consumer normally comes, and there's stats across many different verticals, but by the time they come to your website, they're pretty much through the funnel. They're really past consideration and they're probably at the point of purchase. So it's really important that you're able to react very, very quickly quickly in order to create that conversion. Um, the old way of doing things was panel-based, survey-based. Um, you're looking at, really, you're looking in the rearview mirror. And in today's world of, of marketing to a digital consumer, yep. which I, I make the difference, it's not digital marketing, it's marketing to a yep. digital consumer, you really have to use the media, a mobile, social, all of these touch points to learn in real time. So it really is, it's not only buying media, it's research as you're buying the media. Yep, great, great. So Shane, one of the big considerations that we've talked on, we've talked about getting people down the funnel, and I think one of the big objectives for brand marketers is often cultivating loyalty. So in this new digital brand environment, what are marketers doing to try and cultivate loyalty when they have so many new options in terms of reaching consumers and talking with them? Yeah, uh, thank you, good morning. Um, first of all, Welcome to Kohler, uh, as yeah. the Kohler representative here. Um, 
And uh, thank you for ho or, uh, hosting uh, and, and having the summit here. We appreciate that. Um, uh, and I, w I would just throw a pitch to the, the design center. We had we talked about that earlier. If you don't get time for the tour, at least um, walk over there and, and you can do a self-guided tour and and, uh, and I think you'll enjoy it. Um, take advantage of what we've got here. Um, it, it's a good question. So let me uh, let me start and, and provide some context in terms of how we approach digital marketing. Um, I run the digital marketing department for Kohler. So within that, we have um, web, uh, social, mobile, and e-commerce. Uh, and, and this is a fairly new organization. We've done a number of things um, from a, a digital perspective, uh, obviously, for a long time, but it was kind of siloed. So um, coordinating the message and making sure that everybody is on the same page and providing that consistent brand um, language is really important. So Bob talked earlier about you know knowing who you who you are and being transparent about that and being real about that. Um, the people that are communicating our messages uh, understand that. So that's that's first is is really understanding who you are and how you're communicating that brand. Um, that helps establish loyalty. Making your uh, your content um, engaging and relevant and personal and not just about selling a product. Yep. Um, it is also a really good step towards that. Um, you know, uh, we were talking. John was talking about you know the app um, functionality where you can you can uh, virtually kind of show your, your your room. That kind of thing where you're really engaging with the customer. You know, we've got similar versions of that um, on on an app um, where we're providing more of a design service. Um, I think that that really helps establish a loyalty so that it's. As a consumer, you feel like you're interacting with the brand and it's personal, it's not. Uh, they're just trying to sell me the, the latest product, the, the latest toilet that came out. Great. So Gary, with so many different platforms coming out, coming and going, how does a marketer, how is a marketer able to choose between those platforms and anticipate which ones are going to take off and which ones are going to fizzle? What advice would you give to marketer, other marketers? Yeah, today? I think... I think the challenge we've got right now is the reality is everything's going to go digital. I mean, people may not like to hear that, but the reality is smart TV will drive digital end-to-end yep. -end on everything. Google's already there with its you know, DVRs, set-top yep. box technology. So it, that will start in Western markets and move to East in it maybe 10 years. But the reality is everything's going to go digital. That changes the complexity of, of what we do because the traditional market I would do the print and the TV and push it out, walk away and that's mm -hmm. it, right? And mm -hmm. they'll do some survey, panel surveys and that's it. Today we're faced with an environment where ironically digital can measure a lot of things. Um, but the challenge we've got is the tools aren't always there for us to do that. And I think what's happening in organizations is now is you've got to create people within the companies that start understanding platforms, start yeah. understanding technologies, um, and not rely on agencies to do that for you because they sometimes have vested interests. Yeah, sure. And not only vested interests, some of the best technologies and best things you should be working on are either startups or new companies that are coming through, mm -hmm. uh, which a lot of the agencies are not even seeing, right? They may buy them up. I mean, Vitru just got bought up recently. Sure. Um, Salesforce.com bought um, Body Media. Yeah. And this, this is just keeps on going, yep. right? And they, that becomes part of the vested interest of, the, of those companies. So, you know, part of my, a large part of my role is to understand what's going out there in the marketplace and, and bring things in and evaluate and test. And yep. I started off in e-commerce mm -hmm. and built, helped build the e-commerce business in, in Lenovo with very little dollars in terms yep. of marketing. And it was all, how do you test something? You put a limited test with clear yep. goals in. And then if it works, then you, well, what's the scalability of that test? Yep. Um, and force the issue, right? Mm -hmm. If you say something you want to go and get done, how do you go back to the agency and force the issue of the agency yep. to either be partners on doing that and help you do that? Mm -hmm. And we're doing that with audience, audience management platforms. I'll come to that a little bit later, but yeah. we're looking at audience management right now. Is Great. It, is big Gary, you raise a really good point about agencies. Where does a brand marketer yeah. really go to get the help and the support that they need? Because you're talking data now. You're talking about enterprise software or something that has to be behind the corporate firewall. You're not going to have your agencies basically managing your data. But I think it's been clear that there's 
uh, a barrier or a, a disconnect between the marketer and the IT departments. They don't really, the CMO is not normally the number one client of the IT department. So where are marketers supposed to turn to really get the advice and the expertise mm -hmm. that they need to adopt these new platforms? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> go to Google. Um, <laughs> I think this is where the value of plugging these types of environments, you've really got to network with your, your peer groups, right? And that can be down at a technical level, it could be at a branding level, but you've got to get out there and get to conferences like that, meet other people, see what works, yeah. meet other vendors, uh, and, and push, push, the th push the onion that way. Yeah. It has to be done yeah. that way. So that, that's a good segue to some of the partnerships that you have. It sounds like you know, you're a proponent of going out and networking and identifying some of these companies, but what about some of those traditional partnerships? What is the role of the agency today and how is that changing with this new marketing environment? And John, if you could take that one. Yeah, um, I think for us, I can only speak to kind of my experience, but um, the lines have kind of morphed, right? So 10 years ago, the ad agency did the TV spots and the print, and the PR agency just did public relations and digital, maybe just did your website or whatever it might be. And I think nowadays, uh, at least for us at, at Valspar today, I mean, we're most interested in the idea and where the good idea comes from, and then we're willing to let different agencies bring it to life. So a good relevant example for us today is our PR agency came up with an idea for us to actually get celebrities to talk about you know, a room in their house that they wanted to paint and the color that was inspiring to them. And to Bob's point, good or bad, we donate money to uh, ha Habitat for Humanity for each of you. So that's kind of the hook to get people to watch these videos online. But the PR agency came up with the idea and they actually shot, filmed the content, produced it, did the work that typically you would assume the traditional ad agency would do. And so, um, as everyone in this room well knows, I mean, all these agencies now offer capabilities in, in all the areas that you would expect, whether it's creating content or digital. I mean, they have a digital arm as well that did the uh, website interface for us. So we, it's more of kind of a jump ball now, I guess, in terms of, you know, we have a strategy and whoever has a good idea to help us execute that and articulate that with consumers, um, we will consider it. We're no longer kind of looking specifically for agencies to bring things to do. So, I mean, just to add to that point, we're in the same boat. We have multiple agencies. You know, we have a creative agency. We have uh, we have an agency that does the website, we have an agency that does uh, social, uh, it's very fragmented. So the reality is the, the onus is on the client to help pull all these things together, which then goes back to the, the technologies. It's, if an, an agency is only just doing one thing, how do they have the vision across everything? Yeah. They can't. Yeah. So. Yeah. Was that role traditionally your traditional agency of record before and now it's well, we used to have one, yeah. The yeah. We've got many now. And I think I see that more and more with a lot of big brands that are going out to many, many agencies. Yeah, yeah. So and I think we have to evolve. I mean, back when I was IBM, you know, because um, Lenovo bought the PC business, I affectionately term, we were the dumb client. We would turn up, approve the creative, and walk away. So <laughs> things have, to have radically evolved from that. But yeah. that's where a lot of the traditional marketing was. We were the dumb client. We had a product, we wrote a brief, we proved the creative, and, and then it was gone. And I think those days are so far gone. Yep. I think the agencies have to evolve as well because it really is about the consumer and we all know now they move across all of these channels and so for the agencies to be siloed, I mean that's a lot of responsibility for the marketer themselves to have to be the one to pull it all together. The agencies themselves too have to evolve and be more holistic in their view of the consumer. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it sounds like marketing has a, an expanded role and I think Shane, your role actually has includes marketing and also e-commerce, so expanding kind of a sales role in addition to a marketing role. Do you think that that's going to become more common yeah, among I think, marketing companies? Yeah, I think the, uh, the benefit that we see is, um, first of all, from a, a staffing perspective, you, you have some synergies in, in terms of talent. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, if you've got somebody that's developing content, if you've got somebody that is, is touching the, cons uh, the customer, um, you can you can access that. So 
Uh, you know, one good example would be, uh, you know, because we have Color.com and we have very relevant content there, we're really trying to uh, inspire and aid somebody in designing, a, uh, as an example, a kitchen. So we created a kitchen selector tool where you can, you know, match a, uh, a sink to a faucet, you know which product goes with which, then you can change the color and, and match it to a countertop. That's really relevant, that's, that's very powerful content. We can then take that content and, um, and syndicate that to our, our e-tailer partners, so our e-commerce partners, who also have that same interest in making sure that they're helping the consumer um, understand how to design a kitchen. So, you know, that's just one example of where you really start to um, to leverage, you know, the ability to to have that all under one house. Yep. Gary, is that is that a trend that exists at Lenovo as well, or is it still more separate than together with marketing? Um. We, we have a term called orchestration, so we run group team meetings to bring everything together. Um, but everything, we have social separate from the, the web team, separate from the creative team. Um, then there's an e-commerce team who have multiple disciplines inside it. Um, and they're all brought together for big brand campaign launches. And, and again, it's the client that's orchestrating the whole of this activity across everything that's going on. I think the other thing that, that maybe um, provides a benefit is we tend to think, you know, Kohler's a private company. We've been, we were founded in 1873. Very long-term uh, kind of thinking, and, and we can afford to do that. Um, still family-owned. So we're constantly thinking about long-term strategy. So when we're talking about any one of the different channels, um, e-commerce, web, mobile, social, in, in my case, uh, we're thinking about how does that fit from a strategic perspective. Mm -hmm. And so um, that allow, having those under one organization really allows us to, to um, make sure, ensure that, that whatever activities we're doing in those channels align with our business and channel objectives and strategies. Yep. Yep. I have a question. Um, in terms of e-commerce, there was a study that I read last week, and it was a shopping cart abandonment. I believe it was like $1.4 trillion lost in shopping cart abandonment. So how do you unify your e-commerce team to then, I guess, I'm not certain what team would then take over, but remarketing to those who left your site and didn't purchase is, is an enormous amount of, of revenue potential lost. Yeah, and um, I can't speak to that because uh, from a... From a commerce perspective, we uh, transact most of our e-commerce through e-tailers. So Home Depot.com, Lowe's.com, Amazon, that kind of thing. So, so they would have that kind of responsibility. We do sell some directly on, on Color.com, but it's mostly like service parts and, and some seats, toilet seats. It's, 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 it's an awesome business. In our case, e-commerce. Well, we have e-commerce in a number of countries. We, we ha the e-commerce team are responsible for doing that. Yeah. So, and they have the whole site is tagged up and will retarget at different levels. Yep. You know, more at the prospecting level right down to the car level. But it's ultimately their job. Countries where we don't have e-commerce, then we don't have as much retargeting going on, unfortunately. So. So Gary, what about measurement? I mean, that is a major challenge for marketers, and it's only getting more and more complex when you have more and more channels, both online and offline. So how are you coping with the, the measurement challenge, and you know, what advice would you have for, for other marketers in that space? I think uh, you know, I, I brought up in the briefing we discussed, but if you look at where we are from a management point of view, I mean, everyone gets really caught up in the creative and looking at creative and isn't it cool and but very few campaigns if you look at it really massively breakthrough you know the old spice was one but most most aren't so the, i think uh, the the challenge is we got all fess up and realize you, we're in the man, management of waste business when you look at digital um standard flash banners is 0 0.0 0 0.7 percent mm -hmm. click through rates you look at video, which is a lot better, can be three, four, five percent click through rates. There's still vast majority of people aren't responding to your campaigns and stuff. Um, so the reality is, uh, with the complexity that's that's starting to occur even more with the fragmentation, mm -hmm. managing your, your media and making sure you're not wasting media is, to me, is the is the, the biggest thing going forward with digital. Mm -hmm. And I think that that found the foundation of that is going to be around uh, audience. 
measurement? Mm -hmm. And how do you target your audience and get the right reach and frequency management across all the platforms? It's hard when TV's separate today, yeah. Yeah. and eventually it'll all be one. But on digital, I'd argue most people and most brands aren't managing the frequency management of their campaigns mm -hmm. across the audience and across the different sites that we're doing. So one of the things we're looking at doing is, is how do we bring things into digital that better helps our management of uh, the frequency of our campaigns. Because mm -hmm. you can, and I'll give you a real example from, from last year, um, we were serving up our TV campaign at a six frequency. Mm -hmm. That instruction then on the digital side went out, run this at a six frequency. So we ran a test with, uh, with, a, with one of our video perf uh, performers, who's actually up here, um, and we have actually found we only need to run at 2x to get an action. So that was within you know, their network. That didn't take place across all our other video buys. So what does that mean? We wasted two thirds, possibly yeah. two thirds of our media budget was completely wasted across all the rest of our media buy. Mm -hmm. So you apply that type of thinking into your digital stuff in general, your Facebook and your YouTube campaigns, and this is where you have to go is, how do you better manage that? So yeah. that's our focus. How do you bring in tools to do mm -hmm. better audience management mm -hmm. and better uh, usage of the media? Because we don't have massive budgets, right? Sure, sure. So. so do you think that the digital technologies, you know, targeted buying and retargeting, do you think that's helping reduce the waste? Retargeting helps, you know, be more efficient, okay. right? Because that's, you do get a lot of conversions off that. Yep. Um, yep. But seeing your audience across sites and platforms is an industry issue. And programmatic buying also helps eliminate the waste, where you're literally buying impression by impression instead of buying, we call it like the, the buckets uh, of right. tomatoes or cherry picking, like why buy the whole barrel when really only several might be relevant to you. So I think real-time bidding and programmatic buying has really helped decrease a lot of the waste in digital. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, even though we don't uh, have a lot of direct e-commerce on our own site, we do do retargeting and it's been really effective. Um, you know, one example is we have Kohler Storage, we have one in Chicago where you can go in and get a design service and, and they'll, they'll help you plan out your, your whole space. Um, so when people would, would come to the site and look at particular products, we, we knew that they were probably in line for that kind of uh, opportunity, so retargeting them to uh, actually a design consultation for free and, um, and that was a really effective campaign and an easy way to um, create something that was very personal for them. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. John, any observations around what Valspar's doing to measure and to, to reduce the waste in their media buys? Uh, well, this is good. I'm learning a lot. What we should be doing. <laughs> um, I think, uh, you know, one thing we've tried to do with moderate success is move to more of a kind of what we call a brand expression measurement instead of just brand impressions. So the old way to measure PR is how many eyeballs did you get or even media. And I think it's taking that, in our opinion, to the kind of the next level. And if people then take an action based on that, if they go onto Facebook or they tweet about it or do something. So we're trying to aggregate, you know, impressions out in the universe and, and kind of turn those into expressions. And, and count those mm -hmm. longitudinally. The, the yep. trick in all this is metrics that you want to measure going forward, you don't really have a history of, you know, so we don't have anything to compare it to. So it's always like these new numbers and nobody can put it in a proper frame of reference yet. Right, but right. I think it is kind of consistent with what you guys are talking about in terms of there's a lot of waste and trying to make sure that the things we're doing, people are taking an action as a result of. That's kind of the end goal, I think, for us. Yeah. I think data plays a big role in that. Data is becoming a big issue in marketing and a big tool for marketers. So Julie, can you talk a little bit about what leading edge marketers are doing with data? Sure, sure. So I know we had some conversations at, at the bar last night and there was a marketer, the same marketer that you referenced, Julie, when we were talking about um, kind of the disservice that ag technology has done to marketers in terms of trying to understand the different technology that's available to them. So for the most part, like, do people know what a demand side platform is? How many people in the room know what that is? Okay, how about a data management platform? Attribution management platforms. Okay. 
So, so basically there are these technologies out there, but it's been really hard. I think the vendors do the market as a disservice in terms of how do they explain, what are the steps, mm -hmm. who do you need, what are the, the people skills change. Um, everything really has changed in this new world and it's really how do, how do we help them take the steps to realize that it really is about the data now. It's not as frightening, as daunting as, as you hear. Big data has been trending now for a year and, and I think marketers really just you know throw their hands up and say I know it's there, I know it's valuable, I know I need to leverage it, but I'm really not certain what are the steps to take to do it. So there are other people out there, it's more the quantitative skills, it really is the data scientist is like the new sexy job of, of, yeah. of the decade. Um, and there are these technology platforms that can help you through whether it's the measuring, the buying, the attribution management, you know, the end-to-end -end management of all of your campaigns. You know, the solutions are there. It's really just finding a trusted partner who can help you, you know, make the right decisions that are right for your business. So Julie, if you had a marketer in front of you that didn't use data at all for their business, I mean, what would be the practical steps you would ask them to take in order to try and take advantage of data as a marketing tool? If they didn't use data at all? Yeah, or if they only used data a little bit. <laughs> or if they weren't taking advantage of big data the way that they sure, could. Sure, sure. So most of you, I'm sure, are using traditional forms of data sources. So your CRM database, your prospect databases. What the what the digital world has now given is this infusion of new a new source of data and it's basically all of the real-time data that uh, the consumers create across all of the digital platforms. So every touch on your phone, every touch on your iPad, everything on a website is emitting signals. Mm -hmm. So it's really everything you do now needs to be infused with this new source of data in addition to the other sources that you're using. Mm -hmm. Great, great. So Gary, last question. In, we've already touched on it, but in terms of bringing together online and offline, what should marketers be doing to try and think about bringing those two together as they, as consumers are moving across all these platforms so fluidly? Um, so, if I look at well, you know what's happening in the industry and what we're doing, um, what we, what we do for online and offline today is we 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 still on the panel based approach. We're using Insight Express, mm -hmm. uh, and we're doing looking at brand lift. So this is not on the e-commerce direct side. So we look at brand lift, but we normalize that with the cost of the media, because mm -hmm. the TV's way more expensive than the digital, to get efficiencies. Because if you just look at raw um, awareness consideration metrics, it would look like the TV's a lot better performing, but if mm -hmm. you normalize it with cost, then it starts to change the picture. So mm -hmm. that's one thing we do uh, in terms of active management. Yep. I think things that we don't do is my observation, I got a 17-year-old and a 19-year-old uh, kid, kids, and I think there's still a huge gap between the creative and how you activate digital mm -hmm. off the offline. And what I mean by that is, and I think you've posted stuff about distracted audiences and what level of percentage of people aren't paying attention to TV. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're picking up the mobile phone. It's not just going to the, 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 the restroom at, uh, uh, at the break, it's the picking up the mobile phone. I watch my kids, they, they don't watch TV ads, right? Even if they're watching live TV, they pick up the phones during the break. So what does that mean? Yeah. It's a creative change is needed because there's a, the, the big benefit of TV is the visual and the audio experience. That's the two things that, that digital hasn't had until recently with video grown yep. in Western markets. I think there's a huge opportunity to think about what is the audio mm -hmm. signals mm -hmm. off television to better enable uh, a response as people are doing other things in, in, the, in the TV. And also how do you get mobile better integrated off yep. a, a TV spot and we're not doing either of those today and we're trying to push that mm -hmm. but I think that's their key things from a TV point of view we can better integrate these two things together. Mm -hmm. and some companies are doing it, you saw at the Super Bowl um, but most aren't, they're doing traditional, there's a URL mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. or a Facebook URL. Yep. Okay. Uh, we. Uh, the vast majority of our sales are still through offline. Uh, and we have a number of showrooms around the country. And so one of the things that we really strive to do is make sure that what we're doing from a digital perspective um, enhances yeah. and integrates with what we're doing offline. So a couple of a good examples of that. Uh, if you go to our website, uh, and you select your bathroom or your kitchen and you put all the products, um, you can put it into a folder and that folder then can be transmitted right to the showroom. So uh, we enable that to make it really simple for, um, you know, for the, the consumer to then 
uh, go to a showroom near them, it, it prompts them and it, it sends that packet of information so that when they walk into the showroom, they're already armed with that information. Mm -hmm. From the other side uh, of the coin, uh, we're making sure that we're developing tools either through mobile or through, through web mm -hmm. that, um, that enable the showroom associates to yeah. interact. And so, um, in, in a one good example is we have a, a color picker on, on our app that uh, enables a, a customer to look at any one of our products in any different color and then compare and contrast it with a faucet finish. Well, that, that's a really helpful tool because uh, a showroom probably doesn't have the floor space to display every kind of product color uh, that we offer on uh, 27,000 SKUs. Um, so, so that's a great way to integrate the, the two efforts and make sure that we're complementing what we're doing offline and online. Great. Gary said something that's a perfect example of old marketing and new marketing, and it's a chance to plug one of the sponsors. So is anyone from Visu in the audience? No? Um, well, Visu is a good example. We actually partnered with Visu, and it, we're actually running real-time brand surveys as the campaign's running. So rather than, and I love Inside Express as well, but a lot of that is a historic study. Months camp, later. And months later, exactly. So he's looking at a report, and he's, and he's analyzing something that happened months ago, and he's already missed his opportunity to make a decision that's going to really impact the campaign. Visu does real-time brand optimization studies that are gauging the changes in sentiment as the campaign is running in real time and making adjustments automatically. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a much um, more robust and effective way of, of dealing in a, in a real time digital world than some of the, the older ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. I think with that we'll open it up for questions from the audience. So um, any questions for the panel from... Oh, okay, you got it. When you do have a question, Kathy and I will get a mic to you as quickly as possible. If you could just please stand and mention your name and company, that would be great. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, John Ellett from Infusion. And we just did a, a recent study that looked at the gap a lot of marketers have between their desire for great customer experiences and how they're actually delivering great experiences. And with social media being the, the mechanism for sharing great or poor experiences, how are you from a marketing perspective managing the, the fragmented touch points to make sure that your customers are actually having a great experience? Um, I think for us that's a tough challenge because we, we don't control the full experience that the consumer goes through on the paint journey, right? So I mean when they decide to get inspired, they go to certain sources, when they ultimately go pick out color chips, they're usually interact with one of our racks, but the ultimate experience is with the retailer, whether it's Lowe's or an independent dealer for us. So I'm envious of kind of Kohler where you control the full distribution model in certain cases with your own stores. I think in our industry, Sherwin-Williams, has that's their kind of core strategy is they control the process with the consumer end to end, right? Because it's their products at their stores with their marketing. So for brands that don't control the retail experience, which is all CPG brands, I mean, I think that's always a challenge. And the best, you know, we can kind of hope to do is be communicating with consumers, as I alluded to before, I think as directly as possible, establishing these one-to-one -one relationships so that they have respect and trust for our brand. And I think you, they give you the benefit of the doubt if their experience isn't fantastic every time in a given store for whatever reason. I don't think they blame the brand. I, I can speak to paint. It's interesting. If people have a problem with their paint project, they have too much paint or the paint um, doesn't look, if the color's not right in their opinion, they, they rarely blame the manufacturer. They kind of blame themselves. They say, oh, I should have done more homework. I should have mapped out how big the room was. And the color thing is interesting because at the end of the day, that's why people paint. They want to transform a space with color and be inspired. Yet, most people are afraid that the color on the chip is not going to look right on the wall. And so, the, but you know, the opportunity for us, our whole marketing campaign right now is to say, we're the only brand that guarantees you're going to be happy with the color on your wall. Because that's ultimately what people care about. But all of our research said people don't blame us. They, you know, they think, oh, I picked the wrong color. I didn't do my homework. I went a shade too dark and it should have gone lighter. <laughs> so there are opportunities embedded in that if we can be the one brand that's actually helping solve a problem that they don't even blame us for, but we're there to kind of have their back. I think that helps overcome any retailer challenge that they may encounter along the way. Yeah, I, I think... Um you know, we do it in, in a couple of ways to make sure that we're, you know, this, this whole forum is really about brand and, and that's one thing that, um, you know, we fiercely protect, you know, and uh, Bob talked about exuding the, the donut love. Um, 
with Krispy Kreme, we exude the uh, toilet love uh, at Kohler. And uh, so the people that, that are responding to that kind of um, customer engagement, so whether it's um, on Facebook or whether it's click to chat uh, that we have enabled, they understand the brand, they understand the consumer experience, they understand that we want to take care of the customer first. And so um, we make sure that, that we are very transparent in terms of if they have an issue um, and, and uh, apologize for that and make sure that, that there is that, that follow up and um, and touch point that they really understand that they're talking to, to not only to a, a person on the other end, but but a, a real personal brand. Mm -hmm. Great. Oh. Uh, Amy Bartle with La Quinta, and it, it's interesting. You know, we're in the hospitality space; it is experiential. But as we all see the digital consumer interacting every place on every device, and most of your examples are experiential. It's how do I repaint my room on my iPad? How do I see what the kitchen sink looks like in brush nickel versus a, another material? How do I see from all the data points what's the real world of engagement and research as I'm, I'm doing whatever? Is it becoming to the point that even down to our planning level we as marketers are now wholly within the experiential preview as opposed to the product or storytelling preview? It's, it's a good question. I, I'll go first. I think, um, I think it's more relevant. I think it's more engaging if you have that kind of experience. Um, I just know as a consumer if I'm, if I'm shopping for something, um, I want to I want to have some context to it. I want to have something more than just reading, you know, what are the features and benefits of that product. And so I think that's the challenge for us is, is making it um, a good experience, making it relevant, um, and not just um, very uh, overtly trying to sell a product, but more about really providing value um, along with that experience so that, that you do become somebody that, that people want to seek out. Um, independent of just that particular faucet or that particular toilet, um, that, that goes to that brand loyalty and that goes to you know, the whole experience. Yeah, I mean, I think quickly for us, I, I think I completely agree with your statement. Like, you know, unfortunately in our world and probably in a lot of worlds for all of you, you know, products at some level are interchangeable and with the quality of private label in the packaged goods industry, private label is now north of 20% in most, in most categories. And if you talk to consumers, most consumers have a good experience with the private label brand that they've purchased. So as consumers are increasingly promiscuous and I think loyalty is kind of a dying idea, right? It feels like um, for us, my industry is particularly challenged because if I come up with interesting colors and interesting names, which is a fun part of the job, but um, it, every color can be matched in any hardware store with the spectrometer and all these things, right? So I can't even own a color that's unique to me that can't be duplicated. And so the only way we think we can compete is to make the experience easier for consumers and help them all along the way. And if we're providing services like the app or other things you referenced, you know, hopefully what we're doing is helping consumers so that at the end of the day they feel some positive disposition towards us and they side with us more than a competitor. But that is the biggest challenge what you alluded to that I, we face, I think all marketers face in my opinion. Great. Any other questions? Any other question? Oh, okay, right here. So uh, there's, there's uh, I hear you guys talk, oh, I'm J uh, Jason Oates from Live Intent. Um, there's a lot of research out there that talks about um, how consumers, the number one way they want to engage with brands uh, in, in, a, in a dialogue or uh, in many ways is, uh, is email. And um, so in, you see you know, Facebook and Twitter and Zanga and every social media company, they've you know, switched over and now, you know, are the largest email marketing companies uh, in the world. So how are you guys using email as a way to truly engage and have that dialogue with uh, consumers? Uh, it's interesting. Uh, email depends on the age group. If you talk to the 18 to 24 year old, they'd say email's a dinosaur. So uh, it, uh, the way we use email primarily is on the sales side. So it's fostering the sales in terms of you know, capturing an email address. 
telling people s stories about the brand and then obviously leading to promotions and things like that. That's primarily how we use email, to be honest with you. A lot of the experiential stuff is moving more into the social channels of building stories and we have a lot of people posting about how they're using the product, really some interesting stories of going to mountains, going across deserts and that's, that's the thing that actually gets the most interest on our, on our social channel. So that ignites interest across you know, the audience and they start talking about it and they understand the benefits of our product in the context of you know, helping achieving and doing. So I think email for us has become a very executional animal. Uh, in terms of driving sales, and if you look at the data, it, it is one of the best sales converters. And socials become more of the, the storytelling, community, community type engagement uh, mechanism for us. Yeah, I think for us, uh, it provides a good, good tool for segmentation. So um, we use that to to make sure that we're targeting, as an example, the trade. So if we, we want to communicate a message about um, water conservation or um, uh, let's say color to interior designers. We know who we're sending that that message to, and it's again very personal, very relevant. Um, I think that's a that's a good tool to to segment that information. Yeah, we're we're probably the same. I'd say we do similar things, mm -hmm. customize. You really have to determine the brand has to determine where are your customers and where are they having the conversation, and you have to use whatever mechanism that they're using to communicate more effectively. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I think we have room for at least one more. So, Hi, I'm Chad Maxwell with Starcom. Um, I really liked your panel. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, something that really kind of got me thinking was the role of the agency when we started having the agency talk, right, for obvious reasons. Um, and what I heard was, you know, big data is behind the wall. I heard that agencies are fragmented, right? And it's an enormous burden for the marketer to have to kind of herd the cats. So in this realm of big data is not accessible, but big data is important, in a world where we're merging media, creative, and technology, but the agencies aren't necessarily talking to one another, but the marketer doesn't want to burden, uh, you know, kind of herd the cats on the client side, what is the expected interaction in terms of data, the client, and the agency, and what's the role, and how is it evolving? Big question. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll give you our quick example. Um, I think, you know, it's interesting your point about data and whether it's accessible or not. I mean, in the last two years, I think we've made a very deliberate effort to be much more transparent with our agency partners about our sales, frankly, even our profit. I mean, once they all sign kind of the appropriate NDAs, you know, we start involving them in the business and our approach, correctly or incorrectly. I'm not saying this is necessarily right, but I mean, we. We do very collaborative planning, and as I alluded to before, it's, it's not kind of calendar-based, it's, it's ongoing, where we bring in all of our agencies, certainly on a monthly basis, and if we're in the midst of launching a, you know, initiative, we'll get together weekly, but we bring the agencies in, and we always start with a kind of business update, here's how things are progressing, here's point of sale data from the last month, um, and then we try to turn the challenge over to all the agencies and let them come up with ideas, as I alluded to before, I mean, if, if the PR agency has a great idea of how we can deliver a message, um, we'll let them run with it, and, and our agencies to date, at least what they say to me, I don't know what they say behind the scenes, but they appear to collaborate pretty well. I think they'll share ideas, and you know, there's not a ton of kind of defending their turf, for the most part. Um, so I don't know if that's a testament to the you know people we have in the room or agencies just understand that today's world you can't really be myopic about your little zone. You have to be willing to let others play there as well, and in turn, you get some new opportunities versus what you used to. Also, with any new trend, a new ecosystem always has to evolve to support the changes. And, and the agencies don't go away. I think it's more, it's how you look at how you, your engagement with the client. So business used to be cost of media. You're tacking on margin cost of media. I think a lot of the new technology, it's transparent. As to Bob's point as well, everything is about transparency. So, so the client knows they can buy it better, faster, cheaper on their own. But the agency as a partner can look to, so what does data mean? There's all this data and analytics and the, the marketer needs help. So perhaps it's changing the offering, changing the services, changing the people and the skill sets. There's a, a McKinsey study that talks about the shortage of the quants that it's, I mean, any college kid today should be majoring in science or math. There's just such a future now in data and analytics. So provide, you know, that skill set inside the agency to help your marketer. So, so for me, it's an opportunity to just develop new services that better aid today's marketer. 
Okay, I think we have to wrap it up, but um, please give them a round of applause. That was a great session. So thanks, everybody. Um, so our, our, next, uh, our next presenter is 